Um, questions about the material in week one have come to us uh, from the Google form that was emailed to you in this morning. Uh, but we've also picked up some particularly in interesting questions from the discussion forum on the course website. And this is a good time to remind you that uh, you can ask questions at any time on the discussion forum. Uh, click on ask a question from the course dashboard. dashboard. Uh, we're usually quite prompt in responding uh, within a few hours typically. Uh, during these live sessions, you can also type any questions in the chat box here in Zoom. Um, so we have uh, some time um, uh, to discuss week one material. Uh, but before that, I'll address a couple of questions about the course itself that have come in. Uh, then I'll, uh, the, I think there are a few questions from my introduction to ornithology lecture. Uh, but most of the questions are about the material covered by my colleague, Dr. Jaipal. Uh, and he'll take over then to answer questions about his lectures from week one about uh, diversity and classification of birds and evolution and speciation in birds. So uh, first about the, the course itself, um, several people have asked about uh, transcripts and captions. Uh, and of course, these are very important, especially when listening to technical kind of lectures with, which has have their own jargon. Um, and we've, we've worked to get those together. Uh, they're being proofread, they'll be available very soon. Um, and we're working to try and ensure that the transcripts and captions on the videos are available at the same time that the videos are released. Uh, please bear with us on this, they, they'll come very soon. So you will have uh, uh, proofread proper captions on the YouTube videos. Uh, when you are viewing them, you'll be able to switch those on. And in addition, you'll have uh, accompanying each video, you'll have a document that you'll be able to download, uh, which has the screenshots from the videos as well as the actual uh, transcript the text of what has been been spoken so that you can download those and you can read those so you, in fact you can go through the lectures by reading them uh, not just by listening to them uh, so this is all uh, in process a um, couple of questions Gaurav asked whether after taking this course there could be opportunities to be part of research projects and so on um, at the moment we haven't built any tight links uh, between the course and any ongoing projects but that's something that we're thinking about, but uh, the certification you receive, if you do uh, write the final exam and get the certification, that certification will certainly help if you ever apply for uh, such opportunities. Um, there's a comment that week one was very theoretical and tough and lots of mugging, mugging up will be required. My response is that this is an academic course uh, being taken by many students for academic credit. And so we need to adhere to high standards of academic rigor in the course. Uh, it's not, for example, a course for you to simply learn about bird watching. Um, and if that is your purpose, then this may not be the right course for you. Uh, so it is really a course that has uh, uh, the academic rigor that the faculty together thought needed to be had. Uh, by the way, mugging up should not be required. Typically, all the weekly assignments are open book, which means that you can uh, while answering them, you're, you are welcome to view the uh, videos. You can look things up online and so on. Also, you have 10 full days to complete each weekly assignment. So there's a lot of time. Uh, but it is true that the final exam will be a closed book exam. And related to that, there's another question about the final exam. Um, uh, yeah, so just to uh, make sure that you all understand the final exam uh, will be conducted in person at specific exam centers. There are exam centers all across the country and in fact in multiple countries, not just India. Uh, but you have to register separately for it and although the uh, taking the course is free, writing the final exam costs, uh, costs a small fee. Uh, but if you do want the certification from NPTEL, then uh, you will need to register, pay the fee and take and pass the final exam. There are some cutoffs for uh, certification. So you'll find the link to register uh, for the final exam. You'll find that link on the course dashboard. Uh, the exam itself will mostly consist of multiple choice questions, but there may be a few questions requiring brief written answers as well. Um, and uh, because there was a question about this, I'll just clarify. You'll take the exam at a computer terminal at one of these exam centers. It's not a pen and paper exam. Um, there's also a request for reading material. Uh, and reading material also, we're hoping, will uh, go up in the future weeks uh, simultaneously as the lecture material goes up, the videos go up. 
Uh, but certainly for week one, reading material is available. If you go to your course dashboard and click on week one, you'll see the reading material listed right at the bottom. Uh, you click on that and you'll see the various materials that you can go through to supplement the, uh, the lectures and videos. Um, there's a question, how does one become a good ornithologist? Uh, which is a good question. Uh, uh, no uh, one answer to this. Uh, I, I think the answer is somewhat similar to how one might become a good researcher in any field, uh, which includes being curious about everything. Uh, to go out into the field and observe, in the case of ornithology, certainly go out and observe birds. Uh, read a lot, uh, including, including the older literature. There's lots of fascinating uh, ideas and insights uh, from older authors. Um, so read a lot, uh, discuss with your peers, and importantly, but this is difficult for all of us to do, try and place yourself in a stimulating academic environment where there are other ornithologists, uh, other people in your field uh, who can discuss and argue and, and uh, debate uh, the burning questions of the day. Um, there's a question also that's come in on uh, how important ornithology is in our lives. I think I covered this to some degree in the introduction to ornithology lecture. Uh, and there are both practical reasons as well as social and emotional reasons to care about birds and the study of birds. Um, I, I can't speak a lot more about it. It requires a little bit of structure to this. So I will try and uh, include a link to an article or two uh, about this in the readings for week one. Um, there's a question that came in in the Google form from Mrithunjaya, who said that uh, he's heard there are no crows in Ayodhya and asking about this. Now, I have myself haven't visited Ayodhya, unfortunately, but the first place I would look to in these situations is the eBird platform. The eBird platform collates observations on birds made by tens of thousands of bird watchers across the country. It's a very, very large database of bird observations. Uh, I think more than perhaps 30 million observations uh, from India alone, and more than a billion observations from the world as a whole. And so if you go to eBird and you search for, uh, look at the map section and search for house crow or large bill crow, which are the two crows that uh, would you expect it to be found there, uh, you'll find that uh, crows are indeed reported in Ayodhya, maybe less than other comparable cities in Uttar Pradesh. But I leave it to you uh, to explore. Uh, I'll give you the link over here. Uh, I'm pasting the link in the comments so you can click on that and explore for yourselves. Uh, these were all the um, some of the questions that I was able to ask sort of in my, my domain from the Google form that was circulated this morning. I'm just going to look at the uh, chat box um, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Jaipal. So when will the lecture transcript be uploaded? Uh, should be very soon. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you an exact, it depends. We're trying to coordinate between us, the faculty and the course coordinator Devika and the uh, teaching assistant Jobin, as well as uh, from the MBTEL side. So we are, we are doing this as quickly as we can. Will we provide the PowerPoint presentations? No, I don't think so. Uh, although the transcript will have the slides and accompanying the slides also the, uh, the text. So the not the PowerPoints as PowerPoints. Is there any WhatsApp group for the course? No, there's no WhatsApp group. Uh, we can't have it uh, because there are 4,700 and some people registered and um, uh, it's not possible to have a social media group, I think, for this. Uh, better make the exam 100% multiple choice questions. Yes, easier for us, but as you know, multiple choice questions uh, don't uh, test uh, somebody's understanding of the topic as well as other kinds of questions. So we're trying to find a balance between the two. Um, Stuti asks, will this course help you study wildlife uh, management? Uh, I think so. Uh, definitely, there'll be many topics that overlap and uh, having certification from here uh, should help, I would imagine, in uh, also gaining admission to courses like this if uh, they look at your CV and so on. Um, but there's a direct message to me. Um, some of the reading material is not free and some of it costs a lot. Would you still strongly suggest getting those if one wants to appear for the certification exam? No. We don't expect you to have uh, read and understood any material other than what is being presented to you in the lectures, uh, in the videos. 
<clears throat> for the final exam. So uh, the additional material is purely for your own exploration. If you would like to explore the subject in more detail, you're very welcome to uh, read the additional material and purchase if you wish. But uh, we will make sure that the exam uh, and passing the exam or doing well on the exam does not depend on your ability to purchase uh, material that's not already free and that's not already covered within the lectures of the course. Can you explain the system of credit transfer? I'm afraid that that's not something that I uh, we can help with the faculty because we are not familiar with it ourselves. Uh, typically, your institution uh, is who you have to approach and uh, tell them about uh, Swayam and NPTEL and um, um, I don't know any more than that. Uh, you could write to NPTEL for uh, any details, but it's not something, unfortunately, the faculty of this course can, uh, can help you with. Uh, is bird photography essential to becoming a good ornithologist? Uh, absolutely not. I think the majority of ornithologists are not uh, bird uh, photographers. You may take some record shots to document your uh, research, but you certainly don't have to be an expert in photography. Um, how often will we have these question answer sessions? The answer is we'll have them once a week. Once a week at this time, uh, 4 p.m. on Fridays, typically. There may be one or two weeks, including next week, where the faculty member who's uh, the relevant, whose material will be discussed, may not be available. And so we'll have, I think, those on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, that's only two of the 12 weeks, I think, we'll not have it on a Friday at 4 p.m. Otherwise, uh, if I remember correctly, 10 of the 12 we'll have it on Friday. Uh, I don't think there are any public holidays. If there are, we might have to reschedule, but typically every week, Friday, 4 p.m. Uh, people are struggling to connect uh, Zoom not allowing more than 100. That's right. But it's being live streamed. And I think uh, Sri Balaji from NPTEL has already um, put the uh, link to the YouTube live stream uh, in the chat box. Uh, Endemicity, some other questions for... Um, uh, for Dr. Jayapal, what's the highest degree qualification? My goodness, the, the questions are coming a little too fast for me to deal with. Uh, I'll take a couple more and then I'll hand over to Dr. Jayapal and maybe we'll come back. Um, what's the highest degree qualification on ethology? As in any science, the highest degree qualification is a PhD. Um, there is no degree beyond PhD in any part of the world, I think. Are there any field trips or audio-based questions? No, unfortunately. This is a, a MOOC, a massive on, open online course which uh, doesn't allow for those kinds of uh, interactions. Unfortunately, a smaller course uh, could involve field trips and so on, but not in this. Um, uh, there's a question to design the course for laymen who have a basic understanding of it rather than core biologists. We want to learn sociological literature based aspects of birds too. Um, it, um, yes, I'm afraid, as I've mentioned earlier, this is an academic course that students uh, are meant to be able to take for academic credit, and therefore it is rather academic in nature. Um, you can decide to, uh, you know, interact with those sections of the course that you wish to. Uh, there's no requirement that you do all the assignments. There's no requirement that you listen to all the lectures. So I'm afraid the course is already designed. Everything has been recorded and is being put up. So it cannot be changed at the moment. But uh, as I say, you're free to use the course as you wish. Um, no final exam in the field. Uh, all the final exam at the exam center on the computer. Uh, <laughs> too many questions about the exam. We won't deal any more with the exam. I've already talked about it. Uh, Dodo was painted during Mughal period before it uh, became extinct. That's right. It was endemic. endemic. Uh, that's right. And so it was taken from uh, its habitat um, and it was brought to the Mughal court. One or two specimens were brought and it was painted from those captive specimens, uh, not from the field. Okay, I think I've uh, pretty much exhausted the questions that uh, could be directed towards me. I'll ask Dr. Jaipal to come online. Dr. Jaipal is with the Salimali Center for Ornithology and Natural History in Coimbatore. Uh, Jaipal, are you there? Yeah, yes. Great. Okay, all set. Thank you, Sigur. Yeah, thanks. Sir. So, yeah, I, as you said, the questions keep, you know, not trickling in, but then we're getting flirted with. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, we'll try to, you know, group them, probably answer them. I think some of them have already been answered in the discussion forum. I think probably people should just refer back to the discussion forum. So, good evening, everyone. 
So I just go through the questions thing that one by one and see what the yeah the one question was asked about you know the Newton and Gado's characteristics. So Gauro, I think no, Devendra Taku, he's asked whether you know there's any simplified explanation to understand the biological terms like pallet type, pelvic musculature, deep plantar tendons, etc. Basically, these are the 40 you know characters outlined by Newton and Gado in the 18th century to classify birds. And uh, as I said uh, multiple times before, they still remain the you know the gold standard for avian taxonomy. But uh, I don't really think that you should really go deeper into these things because uh, these are actually even even I wouldn't know much about them because they are you know these are related to anatomical features like the palate type, the intestinal things, and fifth secondary and things. So uh, it is probably not really required. You know, uh, too much details are not required. But in case if you still want to read more about them, you can actually read them in the you know there are a lot of classical textbooks in our mythology. So you can uh, read more on them. And uh, so particularly the, you know, the anatomy of birds, actually, you won't find this information even in basic ornithology textbooks, but you'll find them in anatomy, bird anatomy books. So the second thing is that classification tree being very important in ornithology. And, uh, but please let us know the tricks to easily memorize order and things. So, no, no, I don't think you really need to memorize any, you know, uh, odd names of orders, families, or genera. In fact, these, these are all actually, you know, these Greek and Latin term, terms, binomial nomenclature, were actually designed for the scientists to communicate with each other without much ambiguity. So, you don't really have to worry about them. In fact, uh, as some of them express their concerns, uh, they, you will not be asked about... <coughs> So you will not be asked about the, then the exams as well. So what is more important is that, you know, the relationship, in terms, you can use the common, you know, group names like robins, bulbuls, you know, food, woodpeckers. So I think that's more important to you know, understand rather than, you know, the referring back to them, their orders and other things. But of course, as I said, that if you, when, if you start reading a lot of ornithological literature, these names will you'll get to know, you'll get to, you know, uh, be very familiar with these things, right? So, and cryptic species. So, Sir K.C. Ajit Kumar, he has asked about, he didn't under, fully understand the concept of the cryptic species. Please refer to the discussion forum. And, uh, you know, there is a, there, somebody has raised this question and it was answered. So, basically, cryptic species meant, you know, the what we thought as a single species, but constituting actually multiple species because the morphologically and sometimes even vocally, they are very similar. So detailed studies that uh, detailed studies that led to including the DNA, you know, molecular signatures led to the discovery of more species within what we thought as a single one. So these are called cryptic species. And uh, as it turns out that <coughs> As it turns out that most, you know, some, most of them are actually, you know, evolutionarily closely related to each other in the, in the sense of their sister taxa. Like what I showed in the example is this uh, golden spectacle warbler in the Himalayas. So it was, uh, you know, discovered by Perl Strong, mainly based on, first based on the songs and calls. In fact, uh, I was fortunate to work with Perl Strong for this particular field study in the Kedarnath, in the Uttarakhand. So he, when we were there, the field actually, he played out, you know, these songs in different altitudes, like 2,400 meter altitude and other, other, you know, the same, you know, songs within the 3,000, about 3,000 meter altitude. And the birds, they look very much alike. The same golden spectacle warbler in 2,400 meter did not respond to the call from the golden spectacle warbler from 3200 meter altitude. So that's when, you know, he, you know, he kind of demonstrated that uh, there are also vocal differences. And of course, later they, you know, they got this from DNA from specimens and demonstrated that they in fact constitute more than now seven species in fact. So four of them within Indian limits. So that's what we call it as cryptic species. 
and uh, so of course cryptic species are like a nightmare for bird watchers it's, you know very very difficult to identify them and things like for example we have you know another other other things that uh, i can tell you is that uh, we have pink you know snipes you know they are the waders water birds and the snipes are quite difficult to identify and but particularly two species you know pintail snipe and swino snipe so both are exactly similar you cannot really make out any difference unless you saw the you know the tail feathers in flight so that's again so it's a great challenge for the bird watchers to identify the tails and other than that uh, yes week 1 was tough <coughs> sorry i understand that but as sugeel explained this is an academic course with credits and uh, in fact i would expect the course will get tougher and tougher in course of time with all the population genetic conservation biology and community ecology coming up biogeography coming up next and for your question regarding the low number of endemic bird species yeah see <coughs> sorry islands generally have higher number of endemics because of their long isolation in the geological time scale so obviously the birds you know they get isolated populations get isolated and uh, that facilitates the evolution of endemic taxa but i didn't understand this question beyond that it is uh, possible that the species that is the end of its total life cycle on earth become endemic to become extinct i uh, sorry uh, mr ajitma i don't understand this question but uh, uh, probably not i think what you know it is not that endemic species are the you know the end of their phylogenetic cycle or you know the evolutionary cycle so as i said even the discussion for an endemism is something to do with the isolation something to do with the historical factors rather than ecology or rather than you know or uh, these evolutionary forces and things so it's mainly it's, it's an isolation that's the first you know and overriding criteria for the evolution of endemism and <coughs> okay that's an interesting question kartik sindhu sir what why reptilian and avian females are heterogametic well for yes yeah that's uh, some i actually to be frank i do not know actually so what i know is for sure what we know for sure is that for mammals yes the you know the females are the homogametic sex and the males are the heterogametic sex but for the for mammals and birds uh, sorry for mammals for birds and reptiles it is the heterogametic sex so i do not know actually why the question answer to be why maybe you know you can wait for the population genetics class you know the faculties who will be taking them i think they probably will be better placed to answer your question but uh, in this record i can tell you one something very interesting thing so this is a you know for of course this is a cyanopomorphy for reptiles and amphi you know for both reptiles and birds because they share this character for hetero you know the males being the homogametic sex so but in the population level ecology it's very interesting because the, you know it was jbs haltain i think yeah he found that uh, it's usually the you know after the breeding the male offsprings and the female offsprings so in some taxa the male offsprings they move away from their parental territory in some taxa the female offsprings move away from their parental territory so jbs haldane who spent a lot of time in india during his final years so he found that uh, you know it's it's always this uh, homogametic sex which stays with the you know the parental territories and uh, haldane also came out with a population you know with a with a science paper that explains you know to the population genetics models uh, which of course i am not very familiar with but you can probably ask you ask the faculties later when this course will be taken up right and how do we get practical exposure online using smartphones and upskill one yourself think there are you know i think swell probably handle this and see there are lots of apps nowadays we're going on birds birding apps like merlin ebird and things and 
So you can just explore them. It will be very useful and quite nice as well. And so what research objectives can be taken for studying the bird biodiversity around Himachal Pradesh? Uh, <coughs> well, probably it's uh, too early to tell you more about, you know, uh, I think Dr. Kishan Lal, yeah, to tell you more about what research can be taken around Himachal Pradesh or for that matter, any particular region or location. So maybe you can wait till the course is over, you'll get a better idea. And uh, in fact, uh, after the course, we would expect the participants to come out with what they can actually look into, what they can actually do as a, you know, as a part-time citizens kind of what I call a citizens research. You will probably get more ideas after the course is over. Right. And what are the commonly used keys for bird identification classification? And uh, I think that has been already, you know, what we have already told in the lecture video and also in the discussion forum. But, uh, but one thing which we want to again emphasize is that uh, this is not the course for bird identification in the field. And in fact, uh, Dr. Suhil has shared a couple of uh, very good, excellent online resources. If you want to start birding and bird identification in field and how to improve your skill in identifying difficult groups of birds and uh, you know those information also getting yourself familiar with uh, avian bird vocalizations and other things. So please refer to those websites that you here shared in the discussion forum. Right? And uh, Uday Madan Karatmol just asked uh, how much important ornithology in our lives, sir? <laughs> well, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say ornithology is the only important thing in life. It's like, you know, it's uh, it's just a passion, right? Like some people are very passionate about liter literature, arts and science, astronomy. So just that ornithology is another, you know, think of life, you know, another discipline that people are especially passionate about. And of course, if you meant to ask how birds are important to you know our human well-being. In that case, yes, there are quite a few you know uh, studies and also you no know, documentations available online. If you can just search in the Google how birds are important to human life and as indicators of environmental change or as you know or even you know in the controlling the insect pests in aqua ecosystem. So there's we can <coughs> sorry we can go on these things, but you can, there are lots of excellent resources online that you can see things. Uh, Supashri Sahu asked about whether can we consider the, <coughs> sorry for these frequent interruptions. Can we consider the birds of paradise as the most recently evolved birds? Uh, well, as I said, actually it's the, the the popular opinion among the ornithologists is that the finches are the crows, but of course the finches and thrushes, finches uh, and uh, no, uh, the tropics from North American New World. So they are the now considered as the most recently evolved groups of birds. And uh, birds of paradise, in fact, are very closely related to crows. And so as such, uh, we now know that birds of paradise are actually you know, they are not uh, the recent one, but they diverged much, much earlier, in their much early days. So the birds of that, uh, you know, as I mentioned in one of the discussion forum, Carvide and their allies, like even that includes birds of paradise. So they, you know, they probably originated in Australia, Australasia, Australia, New Guinea. And uh, <clears throat> they probably radiated from there and then colonized the other parts of the world. If okay, that's an interesting question. If your extinction is <clears throat> natural consequence of evolution and natural selection, why do we need to save endangered species? Uh, well, especially there's you know two kinds of extinction. One is that uh, the natural extinction, it, we also called it as terminal extinction or phyletic extinction, but that 
that that's the what we call as the background rate of extinction yes that happens but then that happens extremely you know rare that's not a very frequent one like you know dinosaurs became extinct the kt boundary and some of the early modern birds became extinct so but that takes millions and millions of years but <coughs> but the other sort of extinction is the one which is actually human made you know we brought we are bringing up you know forces that lead to extinction of taxa including birds and uh, so what we are trying to say the birds extinct threatened birds is that uh, because of our action they become threatened right so it's our responsibility to halt the extinction rate so biologists in fact they recently found that the current extinction rates are you know it's hundreds of times much higher than you know the background rate that is the terminal that is the natural extinction rate and if you look at just for birds actually in fact it is i think 6 to 7 times higher than the natural the background extinction but for some of the other taxa it's apparently you know it's stunningly very high so that's that's why it's extremely important to actually engage ourselves with activities that are policies that would halt this process amrit raha do the modern living birds same as notice recorded at the initial time of ornithology amrit i do not know uh, sir what were you mean by initial time of ornithology is it that because ornithology as a science is 300 years old <clears throat> but uh, if you mean to say that early modern birds that almost like you know 60 to 70 million years old uh will these all these modern living birds are the same as probably not and uh, but and their ancestors must if you, for example let's take kingfishers so we have white throated kingfisher we have small blue kingfisher pied kingfishers commonly found in the wetlands okay not so commonly these days anyway but still so now whether do whether they are early modern birds like 50 million years back these white throated kingfishers were there probably not they were not there so the white throated white throated kingfisher and pied kingfisher they probably would have you know evolved or diverged some 5 to 10 5 million years ago i would say 5 to 10 million years ago because that's the average time of divergence by the modern birds so that's what we come to conclusion because we now there are lots of you know uh, phylogenetic studies based on the molecular data is being published and when we look at this modern bird the, the date of time, time of divergence of this modern birds is usually around you know 2 to 5 million years ago sometimes even 10 million years ago but not uh, more than beyond that okay faculty okay i have a suggestion classification names latin and greek do we need to memorize so absolutely not no need to memorize this latin and greek names and where can i find the english meaning equivalent okay that i, I have shared one you know link in the discussion forum it is uh, birds of the world link by cornell in in cornell lab of ornithology there if you look at the scientific name there will be a green circle with the i in the center so you just have to just you know click on that it will show you know it will give you a pop up uh, message that gives you the actual meaning of this greek and latin term so quite interesting in fact you should probably try that yeah. so these are the questions on the google sheet that has been shared let me see if the there are questions in the chat box search so someone has asked is the entity city important right uh well see uh somebody deepak puja okay so uh, let us make this one point very clear in fact the entity city is the concept it was you know pro- proposed by the biogeographers so as such endemicity is strictly to be applied only to the biogeographic units like if when i say that the birds you know when i say black and orange flycatcher it is endemic to the western ghats you know or i can say that uh, you know if uh, 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 if there is you know some like western tragopan it is endemic to the western himalayas so 
and so so on so but uh, what happened is that uh, people started applying this endemicity concept to political boundaries like endemic to india endemic to bhutan endemic to you know uh, indonesia so it's kind of political boundaries so it, biologists generally they frown upon this because you know endemicity is strictly a biogeographical concept not a political concept but unfortunately since everyone wants to know how oh, how many species we have you know endemic to india that's the first question issue you know when i give talks when we give talks to larger audiences this is one of the constant question is that how many species are found only in india so people are very curious to know so otherwise endemicity is strictly a biogeographical concept and do we have an answer to the lack of endemic birds in lakshadweep uh, please refer to the discussion forum i have i think yesterday i posted a, a detailed reply to those two questions and uh, so you can just refer to that and which is the highest degree qualification in ornithology that's Uh, so to be frank I, that doesn't really matter <laughs> what really matters is that you know your passion for the birds and your curiosity to know more on birds and so ah uh, yeah some said the economic importance of the birds and i i, I believe the, the the course will have a bird conservation you know one lecture one week we will be, we'll be covering the bird conservation issues so probably you can wait till that goes is there for getting the economic importance of birds and dodo as kosuel answered that question dodo was painted yes of course it's based on this specimens because <coughs> the dodos are actually you know they were they, they were you know, endemic to mauritius and ray union islands but uh, there are specimens that have been taken out of ray mauritius and uh, perhaps uh, one or two specimens may have landed up in the jahangir's court royal court and uh, in fact if you look at those paintings i think dr sugel has also explained that in the introductory video so there are quite a few species that have been painted and uh, one of them is actually also western trakopan much before the western trakopan was scientifically known and okay then uh yes kashvi motha yes absolutely fine you can you know you can use the grimet et al book and i think that that's a very 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 good reference book very good field guide if you want to take it up for the birding in things how can we distinguish between warbler and babbler in the field by arya devi uh maybe you know you you can just google it you'll get uh, lots of answers lots of online resources of the so as uh, sugel shared in the discussion forum uh okay vasuta kulkarni she said that is the lack of endemic species in the mainland is unique to the indian subcontinent or found in other continents as well uh well i don't know probably because see each subcontinent each continental plate had its own geological history like the indian plate was adrift for almost we conventionally we thought that 100 million years they were <coughs> isolated so but it all depends on the, you know the movement of these continental plates the indian plate movement of the indian plate movement of the you know the laurasia from laurasia then went to the you no know, americas north and south america plates then you have the gondwana plate which again split into australia and you no know, the new zealand and also the pacific ocean islands so each of these uh, biogeog you know each of these plates had their own history so i i doubt it would be the same as the indian subcontinent but probably you know the the reasons biogeographical forces would be very different vastly different Oh, uh, okay. Margo asked, uh, "How do we define a vagrant, vagrant bird, so or migrant?" So, uh, as I said in one of the discussion forum posts, 
you know, vagrant is something like, you know, been historically recorded probably four or five times. So I think there is no hard and fast rule. So it depends on the particular authors. For example, Praveen et al., where, you know, uh, when Praveen et al.'s one of the criterion is that it has to be minimum of 10, you know, 10 reliable records. If there are 10 reliable independent records, you know, less than 10 mini, you know, reliable independent records, then we put them as vagrant over the last you know, 100 years data. So it depends on the, your, you know, particular authors, how they define them. And British Ornithologist Union will have a different, you know, definition, but American Ornithologist Union will define vagrant as differently. And yes, the, Again, the question on endemic, you know, endemism from Indian subcontinent, please refer to the answer posted in the discussion forum. And uh, Sri Ram asked this question, is theropod versus thicotans? Uh, yes, uh, Sri Ram, as I said in the discussion forum, it is, uh, you know, it is still not, it's far from over <laughs> the debate. So though the evidences seem to favor more on the Theropod dinosaur's origin. <coughs> uh, Kashvi Mota asked, uh, is there scientific reason for males being more beautiful in case of birds? Uh, uh, well, this is uh, this this will be taken up <coughs> later in the course, I believe, probably next week or next to next week, on you know the colors and uh, evolution of colors and plumage dimorphism in birds. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that uh, I wouldn't say that males are beautiful or something like that because maybe it's maybe it's for our view that males are beautiful. But uh, for biologically speaking, there are a lot more other reasons, not just the matter of beauty. So maybe we'll wait. We you know we'll probably you know we should jump guns here. And I think there are a lot of expert faculties who will be giving talk lectures in this topic. And is it possible to gain good understanding of vocal behavior of birds? Uh, I understand, you know, the avian vocalization is going to be taken up in one whole week by two, two or three faculty members who have been you know, doing research on avian vocalization for long, and they are very experienced. And probably they would be better placed to answer this question. Are the standards of endemicity different for migrant birds? Uh, well, Mukta Paranjipai. So it's an interesting question. Of course, you know, migrant birds, uh, they cannot be called as endemic because uh, so what uh, sometimes uh, what uh, people call them is a breeding endemic. So like, for example, I actually want to like, you know, we have a, one small tiny civilets, you know, the uh, dark rumped civet in the Arunachal Pradesh. It breeds in the caves in Arunachal and Meghalaya and Mizoram. Megha, I think not Mizoram, Meghalaya. Me primarily Meghalaya and parts of Arunachal Pradesh. So very little known birds. And for long, we thought that probably they are endemic to the Indian subcontinent. But uh, of late, we found that they are probably wintering in the Thailand, southern Thailand and uh, Lao, Cambodia. So a small population winters there. So it is very much possible that we call them as breeding endemic. We cannot now call it as endemic to India or endemic to the Eastern Himalayas. So we can call them, but as a breeding endemic. So I guess that explains that. Okay, I, Ananya Singh. I was under the assumption that it is better to refer to a more recent publishing than a classical book, more updated taxonomy. Oh, okay, Ananya Singh, that's an interesting question. See, these old classical books, uh, their taxonomy might have become outdated or obsolete. But uh, if you really want to understand, you know, understand the characters and why they actually in the first place, they put them together. I think it is the classical books always helps. But of course, you know, the, this helps only if you are academically oriented or if you want to do research or if you really require you know, information for one particular project or research. Otherwise, if you are just a, you know, bird enthusiast or bird watchers, of course, you don't really need to refer back to the classical books for taxonomy, but you can refer the classical books. In fact, we still refer the classic to the classical books 
for naturalist information. So the you know whether it's a ten volume stray feathers by A O Q or the you know the fauna of British India <coughs> by Woods. So or uh, the second edition of the fauna of British India, you know, it's almost seven volume by Stuart Baker. These are they are the precursors to our handbook of Salimudi and Ripley, and uh, the, they are the best resources for naturalist information right now we have. And uh, you know, nothing can really replace them as such. They, in fact, not just naturalist. In fact, I would even say you know the nuggets of ecology as such, the breeding biology, ecology, vocalization. So. In that sense, uh, these classical books are the essential readings, and uh, you know I, I would really suggest you to read these old classical books whenever you know wherever it is necessary. And do cryptic species arise due to competition, or are there other reasons? Chena <clears throat> Desai. Well, uh, this is a yeah, it's a very complex question. Uh, in a sense, you are right. Sometimes the cryptic species might, uh, you know, arise. You know, the they probably have a competition which would have, you know, evolved, which would have radiated into multiple species occupying different niche diversification. So, but uh, I think you know, a couple of weeks later, we are going to have lectures by Dr. Robin and Dr. Umesh, and uh, so. They, you know, they will be talking about this evolution of communities and role of competition, role of you know competition in you know evolution of species and also the role of competition in niche segregation. And is pneumatic bones Krishna Joshi? Is pneumatic bones is a part of evolution which took place in birds? Uh, I'm not very sure about this question, but then yes, like any other trait, you know, like feather development of feathers or development of you know uh, anisodactyl feet in passerines or you know cingulate muscles or any other trait, just like pneumatic bones, is all you know an outcome of natural selection. What we call as evolution colloquially, but it's an outcome of natural selection, which would make them adaptive to the new emerging, you know. <coughs> pressures in the environment or ecology. And you said Sneha Gole. Uh, yes, I have already posted in the discussion forum. Please refer to them for the end of low endemism in mainland India. Do theropods or archaeopteryx? Priyesh Agarwal asked, do theropods and archaeopteryx also have pneumatic bones just like birds? No, in fact, that's something very interesting because uh, looking from the you know, fossil uh, fossils, paleontologists believe that uh, theropod ancestors of birds probably they did not have pneumatic bones. So maybe the later theropods might have, but uh, certainly not the you know the certainly not the, the early theropods. Things. And uh, archaeopteryx also probably not. I don't think so. I'm not very sure, but I can refer you know, to the textbooks. And things. What is the world, world, new world birds difference? Cash fee motor. I do not understand because in the sense that uh, there are certain bird taxa which are restricted only to the world, world, like our you no know, Ioras, birds of paradise. And you know these cuckoo shrikes. So these are all restricted to green pigeons. These are, are hornbills. These are restricted to the world world. But uh, there are certain bird taxa like the toucans or the new world flycatchers, new world warblers. See, the new world flycatchers, new world warblers are completely different from what the world flycatchers warblers that we have. So, so probably they look same. They ecologically they have similar niche and. Uh, Behaviorally, they are similar, so people call them as neat flycatchers or warblers. But otherwise, uh, quite a few taxa are very different between old world and new world. Devendra Thakur, worldwide standardization of system for bird classification is very critical. We updated any plans, seminars, by UOC. Do we have access to it? 
Uh, yes, Devendra Thakur, and uh, yeah, it is a growing concern that uh, even you now uh, IOC has taken cognizance of, and every International Ornithological Congress there is a separate session, plenary session on standardizing bird names and also standardizing classification. But uh, unfortunately, uh, you know that's uh, not happening. And though the efforts are now seriously on to bring them all on one single platform. And so this year, August, we are going to have the International Ontological Congress in uh, Durban in South Africa. So that's going to be a separate uh, plenary session, uh, separate session on these things and where uh, bird systematic taxonomies are going to evolve a common platform. So hopefully this should happen this year. So in fact, uh, I mean, we, we also like, you know, uh, look forward to these things, but at the same time, we should also keep in mind that uh, pluralism is, you know, diversity of views is also very important. You know, <clears throat> one thing is that we standardize the names, we standardize the classification and everything. But then, you know, um, that's not really science. Uh, you know, science has, you know, we, we have different views, you know, these, as I said, that there are four global authorities, but these four global authorities, they are not, you know, randomly assigning species, or they are not, you know, they don't, they, they just, for the heck of it, they are having a different views. You know, they have different philosophies, how they define a species, how they define, you know, uh, gen genus or family, uh, you know, how much re evolutionary relatedness should be defined as to constitute a family or subfamily. So see, these are all differences in the view scientists have. So in that sense, these four different authorities have their own reasons, their own convincing reasons, and they are justified. So while well, yeah, we agree that one standard classification or nomenclature is important for communication purposes, especially for the bird watchers and all these things. And maybe for that, the national organizations can evolve these things like you know that that's exactly what you know Praveen et al trying to do for India but you have British ornithologists in list for Europe uh, for Great Britain and also the AOU for the North and South America I think that's clear <coughs> so. Praveen Ask this question when a bird is critically endangered, someone asks its ecological importance, saying it is critical, then how is it serving an ecological role? How do I answer this? Let's take lesser Florican example for the above question. Uh, Jaipal, can I yeah, yeah, interject? Yes, I was thinking about this because I looked at that question, so maybe I can just take it uh, briefly. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just switch on my video also. Uh, and I think actually vultures are a good example, a better example than lesser florican. Vultures used to play an extremely important ecological role when they were widespread across central and northern India in uh, uh, basically scavenging and removing uh, dead bodies, cleaning up and so on uh, of the large number of cattle that used to just be lying there rotting. Uh, and after the decline of vultures, now they are less than 1% of their earlier numbers. That same ecological role obviously cannot be filled. So when a species becomes very, very rare, it's unlikely to play as an import as important of an ecological role. And so now what seems to be happening is that uh, stray dogs, feral dogs are moving in to that uh, niche, that ecological niche and playing the role that vultures used to play. And of course, people are changing their behavior. They're not just uh, discarding uh, carcasses and many uh, village uh, councils and panchayats are actually forbidding the disposal of carcasses that way because vultures had declined and there was no natural disposal. So many things change in a complicated way. I think that this would be dealt with in more detail when uh, we come to the sections dealing with conservation. But I just one thought I, I thought to uh, put across is that really uh, right now we think of conservation as something we do for threatened and endangered species. But I think actually conservation should be something we do for common species uh, to, to stop them from becoming rare. The common species are the ones who are providing the important ecological services, and we need to remain uh, retain those ecological ser services by keeping common species common. And that's a bit of a shift in the way in which we normally think of conservation. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, pay any attention to rare species, 
because after all, they are unique in their own way and they don't deserve to go extinct. But I think there is globally also a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of thinking a lot more about keeping common species common so that those ecological uh, roles that they play in the ecosystem can remain. So I'll just stop there. A lot more will be uh, spoken about, of course, in the uh, in the in future sessions. Uh, sorry, Jaipal, I interrupted you. Uh, thanks, Will. That's uh, quite uh, nice. And uh, so uh, I just uh, had that also saying that you no know, for Praveen. In fact, uh, Praveen, I would also take this as a very different uh, sense in the sense that I, you know, <clears throat> I um, I wouldn't really first you know ask them saying that what ecological role they would play for their conservation because uh, um, uh, my philosophy would be like every life has its own rights whether they have the ecological you know role documented or not so uh, to we'll move to the next question do critic species hybridize where they are sympatric from shantanu majumdar so jobin had posted that uh, well, cryptic species, as such, they are, you know, generally they are not, you know, they are not sympatric in their breeding grounds, and uh, because in fact most of the times the cryptic species are found, complexes are found, precisely because they are not sharing the same habitat or same altitude or same ecosystem. So in that sense, uh, they seldom hybridize. And uh, but do they hybridize? Probably they might, as I said in one of the discussion forum questions, uh, hybridization in the wild among birds is very common, much commoner than what we think. But then it's just that we'll never notice that because the hybrids they don't perpetuate beyond the F1 generation or F2 generation. So we'll never notice. So only we get to notice them only when the population perpetuates in a very small area, like for example, you know. In uh, Sindh province in Pakistan in 1960s and 70s, there is a hybrid population of, you know, between the white-cheeked bulbul and the red-winded bulbul. So for it, sometimes, you know, there was a lot of buzz in the, you know, there were buzz and, uh, you know, there's enthusiasm in Pakistan saying that, you know, it's the new species of bulbul. But then this population apparently survived for probably some 10 years. And after that, they, you know, it just died died out this hybrid population <coughs> sorry so uh chandrasekhar and vengatraman uh, why andaman and nicobar is a higher number of endemic compared to like shitty sir please uh, refer to the discussion forum where the detailed answer has been posted and if you still have any doubts please uh, uh, post the specific questions if you have any Superstree Sahu has asked, I have a question about Asian paradise flycatcher. I found it's the only bird with dimorphic males. To the plumage of male birds is under directional evolution. <coughs> okay, this might be taken up in the, you know, the color evolution of you know, colors and plumage dimorphism in birds later. But uh, let me tell you a brief answer to that. Uh, yes, paradise flycatcher males have two morphs. One is that white morph, and the other is that you know the chestnut, the rufous morph. So, but very interestingly, you know, we do not know much about the genetic statistical study about the Indian populations. But uh, there, there is one study which appeared in 1980s or 90s about this African paradise flycatcher. So they looked at the population genetics of this African paradise flycatchers. And very interestingly, they found that uh, the males, the first, uh, you know, of course, even the Indian paradise flycatcher also, the first year males will also be chestnut colored. So, uh, sorry, the first, first to two years males with the, you know, the white color, these things. But from third year onwards, some of these males turn to the chestnut coloration things. So that, that was, that's what we've been observing the African paradise flycatchers. So it looks like, uh, you know, the males, some males retain this uh, white plumage and some males retain the, the chestnut plumage. So we uh, do not know as such, you know, the genetical mechanisms or reasons for these things, but, uh, but they apparently, it's a, they're, you know, they interbreed very freely with different morphs and females. 
And if it is whether it is under directional selection, which as I said, we do not know, you know because there is no genetic study as such conducted on Indian birds of the paradise flycatchers as such. And so interestingly, there are some populations of the paradise flycatchers like Sri Lanka, you know, in Sri Lankan male population, there are no chestnut colored, you know, moths. There are only all the males in Sri Lankan resident populations are white. So what you see the chestnut farms in Sri Lanka are actually the migrants from the central India. So, you know, this papers in the reading list said that ornithology in India is way behind the developed world. Can you please throw some light on this? Is this really true? What is being done to address this? How can this group play a role in this? Stiram has asked uh, uh, lots of questions <coughs> saying that ornithology in India is way behind the developed world. Well, I'm not uh, very sure, but uh, well, that that sense uh, in every most of the fields that we, we of course, we lack behind. And uh, because uh, invest, our investment in science and technology is, you know, compared to our proportion of the GDP is much, much lower if you compare this with Western countries like China or South Korea. So obviously, you know, and we are, we, I guess we are picking up, I think last five, last five, one, last five to 10 years, our investment is considerably grown large. And so Sugail, if you'd like to answer this question, particular question. Oh, uh, uh, not not particularly. I mean, I can add a little bit to what you said, but then I thought we'd draw it to a close, Jaipal. I think yeah. both of us are a bit under the weather. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, just to add to what you said, one is the investment. Um, I, I think it's uh, natural that there'll be many other fields that get more attention uh, than ornithology. But as you say, in the last um, couple of decades, there's been a rising interest and uh, a lot more expertise, many more uh, researchers in uh, academia and in uh, NGOs and so on who focus on birds. So uh, it looks like there's a turn for the better. Uh, yeah. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, Jepal, I was just going to suggest uh, if yeah. you uh, have any other questions you'd want to uh, address right now, uh, it's up to you or, or else uh, any remaining questions we would request uh, our participants to post. Uh, in the I'll, can forum. I just go through this chat box? Yeah, yeah. So if it is something interesting that yeah, I think then others, absolutely. of course, we can put the answers in the discussion forum. And European Niger, that's a burning question. And small talk on Polacard gap. Sir, Polacard, Polacard gap will be taken up in the biogeography class later in the course things. And Mm. Is, why is there local migration in black kites? <coughs> so, Akshatra has asked so, Fernandez. So, uh, local migration is quite common, not just in black kites, uh, quite a few. In fact, a majority of our birds, so what we call so called as resident birds, are local, you know, they do show local migrations. So, that's not something which is very unique to these things. And uh, so, no unique to black kites as well. But uh, we, we do have a you know long distance migrant of black kites coming from Central Asia every winter. And uh, evolution of class and birds uh, asked by Adit Mukundan. Please wait for the next week where we, Dr. Anand Krishna will be talking about the bird anatomy and morphology. More on that. Uh, sexual selection. Tuti Roy asked about the sexual selection and the, you know, the birds. Uh, so there's going to be a separate session on sexual selection and mating system in birds by, uh, I think, Dr. Anand and uh, or by uh, Man, uh, Dr. Manjiri J. They think they'll be talking about that. Uh, and also the Sri Lankan uh, biogeography thing. That's uh, Kajavadni Kandaswami asked this question. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. And uh, I, I, I think this, the, the Sri Lankan biogeography, they you know the Indian and Sri Lankan biogeography, they share quite a lot of you know, interesting geological factors and forces. I think that would be taken up with the biogeography class by Dr. Umesh and Dr. Robin. <coughs> and other than that, Uh, okay, thank you, Sugail and Devika. <laughs> so, trend of house sparrow population in India, Rushi K. Sankhwal has asked. 
uh, well, no, see, State of India's Birds Report 2020, which is based on, you know, the last 25 years of the eBird data, and, and the data on the eBird platform, clearly said that the house sparrow population is more or less stable. And uh, we at SECON also has done, a, you know, primary data collection, primary data uh, from across 13 states in India. We are just analyzing that. And our analysis clearly said that, you know, agreed with the State of India's Birds Report. And uh, the rural landscape, it is absolutely fine. They are doing fine. Only in some pockets of the urban landscapes, the population seems to have declined. I think so. Uh, things. Uh, Sugail, I think that's the, the question. Sorry if I missed uh, some questions there in the chat box. So please, you know, post them in the discussion forum where we, where we can actually, you know, put the answers at our leisure. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we are also, uh, you know, bear with us. We're also uh, new to this. The first time we're participating in such a, you know, this kind of course and this kind of interaction session. Um, clearly, there are many more questions that can be answered uh, in any great detail uh, during a session like this. Um, but we also want to keep these sessions relatively reasonable. So one hour long, you know, going more than <coughs> that also doesn't shoot, uh, suit the purpose. Uh, Jepal, I just wanted to check with you once. You said that in uh, Sri Lanka, the uh, paradise flycatcher, it's the white males that are resident there and the rufous ones. Yeah. It's the other way around, no? The rufous ones, all the breeding males are rufous in Sri Lanka and only oh, the sorry, white ones. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I said the other way. Around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the white right. ones that breed in North India and Central India, Correct. they migrate Correct. down in the yeah. in the winter. Correct. The white but white moths are actually absent in the steel. Like the they're absent in Yes, yes. Just yeah. wanted Correct. to check with you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, please do use the discussion forum. I feel it's not used as much as it could be. And uh, those of you who have asked questions for Dr. Jaipal on the discussion forum know that his uh, answers are very detailed and very um, you know full of uh, very interesting uh, information and details so please do uh, uh, consider posting your questions there you don't have to wait for the uh, friday to bring up your questions you can post there at any time so make sure you find it it's uh, under ask a question in the course uh, dashboard um, so i think we'll bring it to a close uh, thank you so much to stevalaji from np10 who uh, who organized this and, and presumably the next sessions as well we'll announce the next session uh, in the middle of next week when that will be. Uh, and uh, again, we'll have a session like this. Thank you to all of you and hope you're enjoying the course and continue to enjoy the course and are happy to continue learning with us uh, about the wonder that is birds. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you.